great. Um, so a little bit about me. I'm a data science lead on the data and AI team at the Washington Post. Um, I work nearly exclusively on elections, on what we call the elections pod, which is a cross-functional team of engineers and designers and data scientists. Uh, I've been at the Post for six, so a little bit more than six years. The first year or so, I was working more on natural language processing stuff. So if you have questions about this, then, you know, um, I'm happy to think, like answer those also. Um, and before that, I worked at, um, a, a, I was a data scientist at Sidewire, which is a media startup in San Francisco, or was a media startup in San Francisco. Uh, my background's in mathematical and computational science, or like applied math. Um, and then I got a master's in statistics, and I'm originally Austrian. And at the bottom, there's a picture of Vienna, which is where I'm from. Um, all right. So before I talk about the election model in general, I want to talk about election data specifically, or like more generally, excuse me. Um, and in general, I think about election data as sort of there, at least in the US, and this is very specific to different countries, uh, there's sort of five pools of election data. There's like election results, there's polling data, campaign finance data, voter registration data, and then demographic data, which obviously isn't necessarily election data, but you know is often used quite heavily in election data. And the way that I conceptualize this is that there's basically two worlds here. There's the like sort of not model data, the raw data that we can get. And then there's like the modeled version of all of these. Um, and so, you know, I've, I've given some examples of this here. This is de definitely not exclusive, uh, like sort of, this is definitely not all the types of modeled and not modeled data you can find in each of those categories. Um, but the way that I sort of conceptualize my job is thinking through all of these different, um, aspects of election data. And, you know, if you all have questions, obviously my talk will be specific about live election modeling, but I want you all to keep in mind that there's a much broader world of election data and election modeling out there. And, you know, there are many different parts to this, and I'm very happy to sort of talk about and answer questions about any particular aspect here if, you know, you all are more interested in something in, in something slightly different. But like I said, so the way I conceptualize it is, is there's these pools of data, um, and then there's like the modeled raw data for each of them, which can be interesting in and of themselves, right? I mean, um, election result analysis is definitely something that appears a lot um, in you know, all, all around in media, but also elsewhere, um, you know, cross tab analysis from polling data, FEC data being just reported as is, you know, like how much of campaign, how much money have campaigns raised? What are they spending their money on? Uh, we can do that without modeling too. Um, and then there's obviously the modeling world, which is where some of my expertise sort of comes in a bit more, uh, which is like, how do we use this data to sort of tell, I would say like larger stories a little bit, or try to infer bits that are not entirely uh, obvious. Um, all right. So why is live election modeling important? Um, this is the problem. Um, this is a screenshot from our live results pages in the 2020 presidential election. And this is our results pages from uh, Pennsylvania. And so at this point, uh, Donald Trump, which you can see here with this darker red bar, was ahead in the counted votes compared to Joe Biden. Uh, this was because of the way that, you know, Pennsylvania was counting its vote. It was counting an election day vote early and absentee vote later. Um, but we all know that, you know, uh, Joe Biden ended up winning Pennsylvania. Um, and this model gives us a way of sort of thinking that through. So these fuzzy bars, which is the visualization that we used for our live election model at the time, was basically uh, predicting that Joe Biden would end up with more votes than Donald Trump. So the darkest bit of these fuzzy bars on Joe Biden's side are ahead of Donald Trump's side. And uh, this model also gave us a specific way of uh, thinking through why this might be true. And this is sort of the estimates on the side, which is we broke down the same raw votes and the predictions for urban, suburban, and rural counties. And, you know, what you can see here is that the most outstanding votes are in urban counties. Uh, you know, that's where there's the most difference between the counted votes, which is a solid bar, and the uncounted votes, which is a fuzzy bar. And also in suburban counties, and specifically in suburban counties, the sort of votes that hadn't yet been counted were absentee ballots which is why we'd expect in suburban counties for Joe Biden to do particularly well. And so obviously in 2020, which is something we didn't really think about at the time when we when we turned when we created this model, this became particularly important because, you know, since then candidates have started using partial results to claim victory, something we weren't really well, to some degree we were sort of thinking about that when we were thinking about this model, but this has made this model all the more important that, you know, when candidates do that kind of thing, we can go like, no, there's actually like We've been saying all along that there are more votes to be counted, and this is what we think the breakdown of those votes are going to be. And so the problem is, like I said, raw election results could be misleading. The order in which ballots are cast 
is not is not random. And so you can end up with candidates that are ahead, uh, even though they're not going to win. Um, the the non-randomness of the ballots can be caused by many different things. In general, rural places count faster than urban places. In general, absentee ballots get counted last, but that's not always the case. Um, and so, you know, the order really matters. And our model gives us a way of adding context to the results that are being shown to give us a reader, to give our readers a better sense for what the reality of the election results, what the reality is. Um, yeah, so that's, that's, uh, that's the problem that we're trying to solve here. Uh, there are also other benefits to this live election modeling, which are sort of, I would say, more specific to the media environment. Uh, obviously, I, I, I gave the point about the context, the results you're seeing are not the whole story. Uh, storytelling, you know, these races are interesting. Here's why these races are going to be closer than you expect. Uh, quantifying the uncertainty in the outcome, which is really important for us being able to say like, you know, this race is actually not over yet, even though a candidate is ahead by a lot. Um, but also saying like, we are not sure how this race will end up going. Um, because, you know, the, uh, the confidence intervals or whatever of our prediction are still very much overlapping. Uh, there's a preparation aspect, which is, you know, this was very good. Obviously in 2020, our model was pretty confident most of the election that Joe Biden would end up ahead. And so we were able to prepare internally for that taking place. You know, we had a week of time basically to be like, you know, we think this is most like more likely to happen. And so like, we can prepare the stories, we can prepare the graphics, we can prepare the like, how did Joe Biden win kind of analysis um, ahead of time. And then there's also the reflection aspect, which I think is quite useful for us, which is like, you know, obviously there's analyzing how well the model did, which is a deep component of what the reflection is, but also like, did what we think is going to happen, did it happen? And if not, why not? And also, can this give us another way of thinking about elections more broadly, if something that unexpected ended up happening? Um, I do want to do a note on geographies here, which is sort of related to the data wrangling point that we were talking about earlier, which is that... Um, Election geographies are really weird and really complicated and also really specific country to country. So I'm going to be talking about counties, which is obviously the subunit of states in the United States, but that is not true everywhere. Um, and I also want to say that, you know, sometimes I'll be talking about precincts and counties. Precincts are what are called voting districts here. And those are sort of subunits of counties. Um, but those kind of, it, yeah, so I'll mostly be talking about counties which then get added up to produce states. But sometimes I may slip accidentally and say districts. But when I do that, please just remember that I'm precincts and counties for our models case are kind of like interchangeable. Um, but yeah, so that's a note in geographies. Um, but yeah, so let's take a step back. Um, what even is the problem that we're trying to solve? So what we're trying to solve is we see election results from counties that are coming in on election night. And we wanna be able to say something about what these early results might mean for the final outcome. And so specifically, we're extrapolating from the reporting counties or precincts to non-reporting counties and precincts. So that's really what we're doing here. We're, we're seeing something and then we're trying to say, like, what does this tell us about all this other unseen data? Um, and so why is this a hard problem? Well, prediction is kind of always a hard problem, um, but there's, there's like particular reasons why this is a really hard problem, which is we have generally very little data that we're trying to make predictions with. Early in the night, we may only have dozens of counties. Later in the night, we may have hundreds. You know, towards the end of election night, there's four and a half thousand counties in the United States. So towards the end of election night, uh, we have you know a lot of counties. But early on, we still want to say something that is informative, and we really don't have very much data. But the crucial aspect to why this is a really hard problem is that the data we're getting is not independent or identically distributed, which is one of the like core assumptions for a lot of sort of statistics or like, you know, off the shelf statistics, I would say. And the data here really, really uh, isn't identically like independent or identically distributed. A kind of easy way of thinking about this is that early on in the night, we're getting results from New England in the United States, which are really small, really white places in the United States. But at the end of the night, we're getting, we're getting something like results from LA County, which is very, very different to any other place in the United States, both in terms of size, but also in terms of, you know, its demographic makeup. Like LA County would be the 10th biggest state in the United States if it were its own state. It's like very different from random town in Massachusetts. Um, so this data is, you know, very, very different across the United States. And that makes this problem very difficult and very challenging. And I'll talk more about how we conceptualize, you know, trying to solve this problem. But then there's another aspect to the prediction part, 
that makes this even more diff difficult, which is we also care about uncertainty quantification. Um, and uncertainty quantification, which is sort of, you can think about as inference rather than prediction, is already a harder problem than prediction. I mean, I'm sure you all know this from like sort of statistics classes that you've taken, like when you're trying to do inference, when you're trying to say something about uh, the probability that what you're seeing, the effect that you're seeing is actually true, uh, you have to make a whole other set of assumptions that are sort of adjacent to the ones you're making with from for the prediction problem. Um, and that can cause sort of a, a lot more issues. Uh, it's also in our case, like very critical to maintaining our reputation. I mean, when we sort of, the Washington Post does not call races, but um, we effectively do say that races are over for the most part. And like, if we get that wrong, that is embarrassing. Um, it's, you know, very embarrassing. And this, these kinds of models get used by organi by news organizations that do call races, like the Associated Press, for example. And in their case, it matters sort of even more so. I mean, the Associated Press saying a race is called in the United States is sort of, to some degree, the end of this election. Uh, and that, them getting those wrong would be very, very embarrassing and very bad for, you know, the reputation of media more broadly. Um, and so these kind, you know, the inference and certainty quantification here really matters. And then the other aspect, which is sort of adjacent to these other two, which is that this is a really hard data visualization and communication problem. Um, you know, trying to tell people what uncertainty means in a way that they understand is really difficult, especially sort of readers um, and an audience that doesn't think about statistics that often and shouldn't need to think about statistics that often. Um, you know, this is a really hard problem. And so those three things, so those three reasons are the reason that the uncertainty quantification component here is really hard and sort of more broadly why this is a really hard problem. Uh, um, so I mentioned earlier that um, what our model does is it extrapolates. And I want to talk a little bit about what extrapolation really means in this context. Um, it's, like I said, a prediction problem, which is we fit a model to the counties that are done counting. We apply that model to the counties that are not done counting it. Oops, excuse me. Um, and, you know, as just sort of a, as the, the kinds of features or covariates that we use in this case are often like demographic information. So I kind of want to walk through a sort of toy example here real quick to sort of, you know, explain a little bit deeper what it is that we're doing. So let's imagine that there's only seven counties in this election. They're all in Virginia. And we were focusing on one, which is Chesterfield County. And we have a whole bunch of data about Chesterfield County, the number of people that live there, uh, the population distribution, uh, demographics, you know, education, household income, and the number of people that voted in 2017. And so, like I said, there's only these seven counties, one of which is Chesterfield. And so we have the percentage of African-American people living in those counties, the median household income, and the votes cast in 2017. And so imagine that we have, um, you know, it's election night 2021. Maybe I should update this to be, you know, more recent. Um, but imagine it's election day in 2021 and votes start coming in. And so say that votes come in in these three counties. And that's actually, those are the votes from 2017 and those are the votes that came in in 2021. And so what our model is really doing is we're computing the percentage change in the counties that are observed. So in this case, in Fairfax County, there was a 17% increase in, um, in the number of people that voted. In Mecklenburg County, it was 40% and in Amelia County, it was 38%. Um, and then we throw that into a model. And in this case, I kind of just threw it into like a linear regression, I think, if I remember correctly, a very basic model where we use sort of the demographic data. So in this case, the percentage of the people living in those counties that are African-American and the median household income to predict this percentage change. And so what I ended up getting was these percentage changes, you know, in Chesterfield County, the county that we're interested in, it was a 27% in, uh, increase would, was predicted, which would have meant if we sort of do the math backwards, 150,000 people voted. And even this really toy model is actually shockingly good. The number of people that voted in Chesterfield County in the 2021 election was 156,000 people. So like even just using these two pieces of information, uh, these two you know features or covariates and three counties and fitting a model to it and then applying it to these other four counties, we get a really, really good prediction here, which is you know to some degree specific to this case. But there's actually a deeper lesson here, which is that for election modelers, which is that within states, a lot of these differences are really easy to, to uh, apply from one county to the other. Um, so yeah, this is what you know our modeling actually means day to day. Um, but what's going on under the hood? Sort of, I gave a, a quick overview here about how these models work. Um, and so our model in particular, and I want to say that we've actually changed our model pretty significantly in the last year. This is sort of a new model that we're going to be using. We used it for the 2023 elections, which were... Uh, a governor election in Kentucky and House of Delegates elections, like the state 
um, state um, parliament election, parliamentary elections in Virginia. Um, and it worked really well for that. Uh, but in 2020 and 2022, we were using a slightly different model, which I'm happy to talk about if there's questions about that. But so one of the lessons we learned is that we now model two party margin. Um, it's easier in our case that there's really only two parties in the United States that, you know, matter. But this model is pretty adaptable. So we could change it if we if there were a third party candidate and turn out. And we model those two things separately, partially because we found that those two things modeled separately give us a really good relationship that is linear. Uh, each of those in part, each of those separately are linear. And then if we sort of multiply them together, we actually get the number that we're interested in. Um, I've I have the actual sort of why is the two party margin. So democratic margin in one year minus democratic margin. Um, I made a Republican number of votes um, in the same year divided by the total number of two party vote cast. So that's dy minus ry over dy plus ry. And then z, which is turnout. It's actually not turnout. It's like a turnout factor. So it's the number of votes cast in this year divided by the number of votes cast in a previous election. And so if we multiply these two things together, um, what you'll see is that the numerator here and the denominator here cancel out, which means we get the margin divided by the number of people that voted in a previous election. And the number, number of people that voted in a previous election is a constant that we actually know. It is not modeled. And so multiplying these two together up to a constant is dy minus ry, which is the number that we're interested in. The number of people, the number of people that are voting for a Democratic candidate minus the number of people that are voting for a Republican candidate. Um, yes, and like I said, we've learned that modeling these two things separately is actually just the models are better because this they actually tend to have a linear relationship in a way that modeling just the margin straight up did not have as of a linear relationship. And so the model that we end up using is weighted regularized linear regression. And you ask, you can ask me like, you know, linear regression, that's really basic. Why are you not doing anything more sophisticated? And part of the problem goes back to what I mentioned earlier, which is we really just don't have that much data. And we would be very worried about overfitting if we were using a more sophisticated model. That's also part of the reason that we use regularized uh, linear regression. Also, the, the regularization matters in this case because there's like outlier counties you know, we might get a county in, I don't know, New Hampshire that does something very strange for whatever reason. Maybe they have a county commissioner election that is throwing things off in a way that we didn't really expect. And so regularization, again, really matters because we're trying to sort of avoid taking those things into account that are sort of driving, uh, might, might be driving our model in a weird, in a weird direction. Um, so the features we use, we always use previous margin as our estimate. Uh, demographic features, fixed effects, uh, which are like categorical variables. And then we also have a state level random effect, which is another kind of categorical variable, but a categor categorical variable where we sort of, that has impact into our uncertainty estimate. And I'll get into that a little bit in a, a little bit later. Um, but yeah, so like I said, this really, the setup here really helps with the small data problem that I mentioned earlier. Lenny, if I can just interrupt you right now, um, this is a two quick clarifying questions, which might be better taken now. Um, the first one is what type of regularization um, do you use, please? Um, so if I remember correctly, we're using L2 regularization. Cool. I think so, um, so like ridge regression, but I, that's something I'd have to check. I actually, I think we've both implemented, but I think we generally use uh, ridge regression. And what's would be involved in taking a third party, a strong third party candidate um, seriously. So thinking of a Ralph Nader sort of situation, like um, you mentioned it's it's doable here. What, what what would be involved in that? Yeah, absolutely. We'd probably have to estimate another kind of why here. Well, A, we would have to change the denominator to, for all of these. Uh, this would have to be three party. And then we would probably have a why two, which is the difference between one Democrat, the Democratic or one of the two candidates and the third party difference. So like, the, the sort of margins between each of the three, basically, modeling those separately. Perfect. Thank you. Um, all right. So I talked about the actual underlying model. Um, but I mentioned earlier that the uncertainty quantification is one of the really hard problems that we want to solve. And so, you know, I talked about a, the linear model. Uh, we use a linear regression. And so, you know, the normal thing you do when you do a linear regression is you kind of assume normality. And then you take your z-scores and you get a confidence interval. And that's really nice. Um, but you're actually making a really strong distributional assumption about your data. You're assuming that your errors are normal. Um, and there are many reasons for us to think that our errors are not normal. In fact, we don't 
we might not even believe that our errors are symmetric, which is obviously what would be necessary for one of the things that would be necessary to have a normal distribution. Um, we think, for example, that, you know, votes are bounded at the bottom by zero, right? A place can't have less than zero votes. And so in a low turnout election, we would expect uh, the error distribution to be skewed to the to, pos to the positive side uh, because, you know, we may have low turnout for most pits, but then every once in a while, there'll be a place that has normal turnout or high turnout or whatever. And so we expect, you know, the distribution to be skewed in one direction. We also believe that our error distribution has larger tails than a normal distribution. Um, generally, this is a good thing for us to have because we are can be robust to outliers. Um, but generally, we just also think that, you know, the, the, the election, election results, we have no reason to think that they're normal um, or that the error here is normal. And so we just kind of want to have the possibility of having larger uh, larger tails in our distribution to be able to account for more error. And so, you know, we don't want to do the thing that we would usually do, I guess, in a in a case where we have a linear regression, which is, like I said, assume, assume normality, z-scores, all the kind of methodological work that comes with a normal random error, a normal uh, linear regression. And so how do we do that? Um, we use a method called the bootstrap. Um, and so generally what the bootstrap is, it's a resampling method that allows us to estimate the uncertainty in our prediction. And so the way it works is we have a data set, which is here, and then we generate, you know, say in this case, 10,000 synthetic data sets. And there are many different ways you can generate a synthetic data set, but just think about the, the, the most basic version, which is we resample this data 10,000 times. You know, we take different versions of this data 10,000 times. We sample with replacement. So, you know, uh, states or counties, excuse me, could appear multiple times. Um, and then we fit our model for each of these 10,000 times. And then we get a distribution of these model predictions. And that gives us a sense for the error in our prediction. Like, you know, how much variation are we getting in our predictions based on these 10,000 predictions? based on these 10,000 different data sets that we have now synthetically generated. But unfortunately, we can't use the bootstrap naively because, our, like I said earlier, our data is not independent, identically distributed, which is, you know, part of the reason why this is a real problem. A real good way of thinking about why this is a problem is I mentioned earlier that LA County is such a weird and strange outlier. Now, imagine that we, you know, had these 10,000 data sets and imagine we ended up with LA County multiple times in one of those data sets. That would obviously be a very different version of the United States than we have in reality. And so that would really throw things off. That's not just like a kind of error in sampling, you know, like, oh, we can sort of skate over that a little bit. That's really like, you know, this United, this version of the United States is deeply different than the version that actually exists in reality. Um, and so we solve that using two ways, using, thinking about two things. Uh, we use a version of the bootstrap that's called the stratified residual bootstrap. And so what is what this means is the residual bootstrap, um, the residual bootstrap is actually a version of the bootstrap that is used very commonly in a regression setting. Um, so it's actually not that different than what you'd often do if you were in a regression setting. And what that means is instead of generating, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about this a bit more closely, I think I have a slide on this, but instead of generating these 10,000 samples by just resampling your data 10,000 times, is you compute the residual or your error in prediction, and that's the bit that you're resampling 10,000 times. Um, and then the other aspect is that we stratify whether a county is rural, urban, or suburban, which is um, basically what that means is in these 10,000 samples is we make sure that the distribution of rural, urban, and suburban counties is the same as it is in the actual United States. So sure, we can't make sure that we get an LA county twice, uh, but like, we might get LA County twice, but we would lose a New York County, um, which is still not maybe ideal, but better than having two LA counties and then losing a tiny, you know, rural county in the middle of nowhere where actually no one lives. Um, and so those are the two ways that we sort of think about um, uh, changing the bootstrap to help us in our for our particular use case. Um, I'm actually going to skip this bit about, you know, the deep dive into how we apply or uh, how our bootstrap method works. If we end up having more time, we can come back to that. Or if there are very specific questions, I'm happy to come back to that. Um, but yeah, actually th this slide I'll take, I'll keep, which is, this is the naive version of the bootstrap, just so you all have a good understanding of how that works is we have a data set, you know, X, Y samples. Uh, so this is like the observed counties, right? The, this is the demographic covariates, and this is the number of people that voted. Uh, and we have n of those, 
maybe 20, maybe it's 100, right? It's a pretty early in the night. And then for uh, a capital B bootstrap samples, we sample re with replacement on the data set. Um, so on this data set, generating these synthetic samples, then we refit our model uh, for each of these B you know, bootstrap samples. We compute a prediction interval, um, and then we can take the quantiles of this prediction interval. And like I said, this is the naive version of the bootstrap, but we use a slightly different version uh, to account for the fact that our data is not independent and identically distributed. Um, all right, other things that really matter for us. Um, assumptions. I mean, this is something that I've sort of thought of, I talked about a little bit earlier, which is like, you know, our model is really good at not doing, of not assuming that our data is IID, but like with every model, our, we do have, you know, assumptions in our, in our, in our data, uh, in our model. And it's really important to be aware of what those assumptions are because, you know, we need to know when things are going poorly because like, we need to know when these assumptions are violated because something bad might happen in our prediction. And so there, I would say there's three major assumptions here, but though I've, I guarantee you, I haven't thought this through it as to the degree that I should have thought this through. There are definitely more assumptions here that I've not thought about. Um, and that's probably bad because one of those might end up, you know, being a problem in 2024. Uh, so the first assumption, which is kind of the most important assumption is that within each strata, that means within the urban counties we've seen within the or not even seen within the urban counties, within the suburban counties, within the rural counties, our data is exchangeable. And what exchangeability means is exchangeability is actually like an assumption that you see, but it's in, in a lot of statistics, but it's often not really mentioned because it's sort of like taken for granted a little bit. And it's a weaker assumption than independent and identically distributed, but it's like very, very similar. What it means is that the order in which you see those counties is basically random. We might see the order of these of the rural counties in any way. Within the set of rural counties, we see the order, the, the order is random. Within the set of suburban counties, the order is random. Within the set of uh, urban counties, the order is random. Um, and again, you know, this is actually not correct, right? LA County, I mentioned before, we know that LA County will be one of the last counties to report because California is on the West Coast. Uh, and it just, you know, their poll closing time is a lot later than, say, New York County. But we're hoping that when we residualize our data, that is when we're only taking the error um, of our data, um, that this exchangeability assumption is sort of closer. That like, in if you're only looking at the error between our prediction and the final outcome, that New York County and LA County start becoming exchangeable. Um, and we found that that is good enough for to make our model work. Um, then another aspect to our current model is that the only correlation that matters is within state correlation. That is counties, uh, we only take into account the correlation between outcomes in count, within, within states, between counties that are within the states. Um, like I said earlier, um, this generally is actually a pretty good assumption uh, for the most part. Um, you know, for all the talk about the US presidential election being a national election, in a lot of ways, these are 51 state by state election or 50 states plus DC state by state elections that are taking place uh, with their own dynamics. And uh, for the most part, this correlation within state correlation is a pretty good assumption, though we are currently working on a version to try and make that assumption, I would say, less strong uh, to sort of, yeah, help us in case things are, um, um, in case there is like sort of more correlation that we haven't taken into account. And the final deep assumption our model is that we have a pretty good grasp on the worst best case margin for any candidate and how much real turnout can realistically shift. And so this means like, we can say like, you know, in the worst case for Democrats, they won't lose a county that's usually pretty close by more than 25 percentage points or something. And we can be pretty broad here. Um, and like, you know, have a pretty like, have pretty broad assumptions here, or we can say like maybe we don't expect turnout to be to more than double in any county um, anywhere in the United States, or increase by more than one hundred fifty percent, or something like that, or seventy five percent, I guess. But yeah, so but like we're we're basically are able to have a good grasp on the worst and best case of the of the shifts here. Um, all right, another thing I want to talk about is where does our data come from? And again, this is very particular to the United States, and this is probably different in different countries. Um, but we have different sets of data for county level models and for precinct level models. And so for, for the county level models, our data usually comes from the U.S. Census or a survey that they run, the American Community Survey. Um, and our results 
on election night, but also our historical election results usually come from the Associated Press. For precinct models, though, precincts become is a lot more difficult. So precincts are, as I mentioned this earlier in one of the first slides, are, are a lot more granular than counties. Uh, you know, counties may have, I guess, a handful up to hundreds, maybe even a thousand precincts, um, the very big counties. Um, what that means is that our model is a lot better when we use precincts rather than counties. Um, that's because there's way more of them. So the model is just, you know, better at learning things when there's more data. But also they, they tend to be more demographically homogenous, uh, which gives our model just a better way of like predicting. Um, but yeah, so generally you prefer precincts, but precincts are not, in the way that counties are a fundamental unit of sort of like the way that America is built up, counties exist. The census knows what counties are. The AP knows what counties are. Counties have, you know, county commissioners and it's a real thing. Precincts aren't like that at all. Precincts might exist in one election and then not exist in the next election. They definitely don't, or like depending on the state, they may not have unique identifiers. Um, they may, like I said, change from election to election. Uh, they may disappear, merge, get split. And so we spend a lot of our time, um, you know, trying to acquire precinct results. We do that directly from secretary of states or state board of elections. So we spend a lot of our time writing scrapers um, to try and get these results. You know, there's a lot of them are open source. I'm happy to talk about, you know, our experience with like open source stuff here. Um, precincts don't have unique identifiers. They need to manually match precincts between results and demographic data. So sometimes we use shape files. This is very ad hoc sort of like, sometimes we have to use shape files to merge things. Sometimes we are able to sort of figure out which count, which precincts are the equivalent of each other by doing sort of manual match back and forth. We've built tools for this, also open source, um, that makes this a little bit easier. But I can tell you the data stuff when we leave the county world becomes a little bit of a mess and is very specific and different state by state. Um, this is another real example of like, there are actually 51 separate elections happening simultaneously. Every county, every state does precinct results slightly differently. And if we are really unlucky, then every county does precinct results slightly differently. Um, so we spend a lot of time thinking about that. Um, all right, one question that I get a lot is how does this model generally do and how do we even evaluate how our model does? Um, and so we generally think about three metrics for how our model does. We think about how good or bad is our point prediction. So that is like mean absolute error or mean absolute percentage error um, from like true value to our predictions for every precinct or every county. We think about the uncertainty estimation, which is the fraction of intervals that actually cover the true value. You know, when I produce 90% confidence intervals, I want them to cover the true prediction 90% of the time. Um, and so that's another metric we use. And then there's a very basic one, which is like, how often did we get the race right? I mean, to some degree, you know, like if we predict the Democrat's going to win and the Democrat doesn't win, that's not good. But also like, you know, if our model said the Democrat's going to win by 0.01% and he ends up losing by, or she ends up losing by 0.3%, like, Maybe that's still good for our model because like our model can't differentiate between those uh, tight margins. Um, and so what I brought here is the results from uh, the 2023 Kentucky governor election. And so uh, the dark blue line is our prediction at any given moment between, I guess, 915 and 1130. The dotted line is the raw vote count. And this dark line here is the actual true result. The Democrat ended up winning by five percentage points. Uh, and this shaded area is our prediction intervals. And so you can see that our prediction intervals covered the true percent, true, the true um, outcome all the time, which is good. Um, we would expect 90% over many, many elections rather than 90% in any specific given one election, because the prediction made at 930 is obviously deeply correlated to the prediction made at 10 p.m. And so these are not random observations. So like we wouldn't expect this to change over one election to the other. We can see the error, which is after around 7.15, 7.20, our error was pretty good for the most part. You know, the, our prediction was pretty uh, close to uh, uh, to the final outcome. I think the worst case here, the difference was something like two slightly under 2%. Um, and we got the prediction right all the time, which is we were on the right side of the 0% line for our prediction, which is good. Um, we also don't just run tests on election night. We have built a whole suite of test beds to be able to uh, rerun elections and 
come up with new worst case simulation for our predictions. And so we focus on how bad our, how well or badly our model did in terms of just the point prediction, but also the prediction interval coverage. Here I brought two uh, versions of our model, uh, two, two reruns of our model from the 2020 election. On the left, we have Pennsylvania. On the right, we have Florida. Um, and we can see on the left here, you know, our model did quite well. I mean, both of these are model ended up doing quite well. Maybe I should add one where our model didn't do as well. We definitely have states like those also. Um, yes, so this is from Pennsylvania and Florida in 2020. This, like I said, was not um, what actually happened on 2020. In 2020, this is a rerun of our model on those elections. And we have sort of made sure that we have built the ability for us to be able to do that in order to test changes to our model, to make sure that if we make a change to our model, we see like, oh, it would have done fine in 2020 or in 2018 or something. Um, all right. And so the last thing I wanted to say is just a reminder that there's a lot more to sort of data, election data than just what I talked about. Um, and, you know, there's a whole world of election data out there that in each of those, if you talk about the modeling aspects of them, uh, you can have a deep dive, just like the one we had now about live election modeling. Um, it's sort of like fractal in terms of how deep you can get and like how complicated you want to make these things. Uh, but yeah, I just want to remind everyone of that. And uh, yeah, questions.